Hello, everyone. Welcome to the annual River Herring and American Eel Survey Training. My name is Ariel Santos. I am a conservation scientist with SeaTuck Environmental Association, and I will be moderating tonight's training. This training will touch on some background about diadromous fish on Long Island. We will go through how to survey for river herring and American eel, then move into breakout groups based on the region you chose to learn more about while registering for tonight's presentation. I am joined by our partners from the Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, Peconic Baykeeper, South Shore Estuary Reserve, and more. I'm also joined by Enrico Nardone, SeaTuck's Executive Director, who will kick off our training for tonight. But first, I'd like to go through some housekeeping notes before we get started. So this training is being recorded and the recording will be available on SeaTuck's website. Please be sure to keep your microphones turned off during the presentations, but feel free to ask questions and discuss amongst the group in the chat box. If you'd like to ask a question live during the Q&A period, you can use the raise hand button and we will ask you to unmute. Our general presentation should last around 45 minutes and then I will begin the breakout room sessions. I'll make a brief announcement that you should, then you should automatically be sent to the regional breakout group you selected. Um, but if you don't get put into a room or would like to change rooms, I'll stick around to help you get to where you need to be. Um, I think that covers everything. So with that, I will hand it over to Enrico. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, as Ariel said, my name is Enrico Nardone. I'm the director at SeaTuck. I've been involved in this river herring uh, survey since I think 2008, which is a long time, but not as long as um, some of the other folks I see on this call. It's good to know there's some some real experts on. I haven't done this training in a while, but I'm good to know that they're here to back me up. Um, I like to start with this image. This is an image created by Brett Bennington at Hofstra University. This is a digital elevation map of Long Island. And if you, if you zoom in a little bit, it kind of gives you a sense of uh, the, the, the glacial history and how it's left all these rivers and streams um, originally carved by glacial meltwater and filled in by our groundwater. Um, these streams are you know, mostly small, groundwater fed, and uh, really represent an, a really important part of the connection between our, our coastal uh, ecosystem and our uplands and our sort of avenues for the movement of sediment and nutrients and wildlife. Um, one of the most important parts of that the, the movement are what are known as diadromous fish. Um, diadromous is a Greek word that means through running. So these are fish that, that migrate between salt and freshwater. They split their life cycles between salt and freshwater. Uh, there's, there's two categories of diadromy, and I'm gonna go through, through them both. Um, the first is anadromy, anadromous fish, there's that root running again, but this is up. These are fish that are running up, so they split, or they spend most of their life at sea and migrate up into fresh water to spawn. So I, if we were doing this live, I would ask if anybody knows an anadromous fish, and that you, everybody knows they've seen on the Discovery Channel, the famous anadromous fish is the Pacific salmon jumping up waterfalls and past grizzly bears to go to their spawning habitat. We don't have any Pacific salmon, um, we even Atlantic salmon were never on Long Island. Our rivers and streams were just too small for them. Um, we have other diadromous fish in the neighborhood that are also uh, too big for our rivers and streams. Our, our uh, anadromous fish are river herring. And river herring is not a species name, it's a category that includes these two species, alewives and blueback herring. Uh, in this illustration, they're very easy to tell apart. Of course, in real life, not so much. Uh, so for the purposes of this survey, we just sort of lumped them together uh, as river herring. They're actually quite difficult to identify uh, in the field. Uh, they're both uh, spend most of the year offshore on the continental shelf and in large offshore schools. Um, but then as late winter arrives, they, they do start to move inland 
uh, starting in the southern part of the country and working the way up. They, it's sort of temperature driven. So as they move then into our estuaries and bays, uh, they then, when the time is right, they move into our rivers to, to spawn uh, sort of the same way salmon do. And I have time in, in quotes here because timing has really nothing to do with it. it has, it's really about the temperature of the outflowing water that they're sensing. And it's usually in the sort of mid to high 40s is the trigger um, scientists say that gets them moving into water. And that can that can vary from year to year. And this, you know, this has obviously been a very warm winter. So we expect that the fish will be moving uh, earlier this year. Uh, they're quite strong swimmers, but not jumpers as they move in, in uh, upstream. Um, and they get into fresh water where they spawn. And this gives you an idea of this video from Rockville Center gives you an idea of what they look like um, as they're milling about. This is sort of their typical spawning behavior, swimming around in circles and milling about, no pun intended. Beautiful fish, I like to say. That characteristic black spot behind their uh, their gills is, is usually easy to see. You can get a side look at them. This is what they look like in, in sort of shallower water from above. This is Sunken Meadow Creek. Again, same sort of milling about activity. Uh, each female can lay up to a quarter million eggs. They had to these super cute little um, juvenile alewives, which then grow up to about three inches or so in freshwater systems before moving out into the estuary again, reversing that trip that their parents took and moving out to the continental shelf to rejoin the off offshore schools. Uh, they then return as adults after about uh, three to five years and make their first spawning runs. Each adult can then live for and make that run for another Five to seven years uh, throughout their life cycle, and they they do they're not um, trying to get to always the exact same spot that they they were hatched like some salmon do, but they are they have site fidelity to the streams where they hatch. So those are anadromous fish. The other uh, version of diadromy is catadromy. These are catadromous fish. Uh, we only have one of these. Um, Again, these are, I'm sorry, these are down running. So these are fish that spend most of their life in freshwater and migrate to the sea to spawn. We have one of these, it's the American eel. And they have a really amazing life cycle. They all hatch in the middle of uh, this sort of North Atlantic between the sort of the equatorial currents and the Gulf Stream. And they're sort of planktonic when they first hatch. They're sort of these willow leaf shaped uh, uh, lepe, that's the word, um, lep, leptocephali, and they're they're transparent. They have no pigments, and they this, they're sort of drifting on ocean currents. And when they get over the continental shelf, they go through this transformation into an eel shape and start swimming and work their way in in stream in, into the estuaries and then into rivers and streams. And uh, when they first come in, this is an idea, give you an idea of what they look like as they're moving into fresh water. They still have um, no pigment, so they're sort of clear glass eels, almost white looking. Uh, I've only seen them in this, in this state a few times. You're more likely to see them looking like this. They're, They've already, as they start to gain pigment, um, they're not called glass eels anymore. They're called elvers. Um, but they're sort of, again, uh, trying to work their way upstream. Well, that they, and just to give you an idea, this is a video from the Mill River again in Rockville Center. I'll give you an idea of what the density of these fish can be. They can gather in huge numbers when the runs are, are, are in their height and they're, and they're stuck. This is a site where they're stuck. There's really only one place for them to move over this dam and they're all trying to get up to one place and they're sort of just congregated there. That's a good idea what they look, how big they are. 
And then they move into the streams. At one time, they were throughout all of North America, all the way up the Mississippi system, all down into the Caribbean and northern part of uh, South America. And they go into the river and, st and streams and, and live there for the bulk of their lives, which can be 10 or 20 years. Um, they can grow to four or five feet long. And um, at some point, they're triggered to return. Uh, they go through a transformation where they lose their eyes get bigger, their, their fins get bigger. And they, they undertake this downstream journey where they swim downstream back out to the ocean and back out somehow to the middle of the Atlantic in the Saragossa Sea and find each other. Scientists have only recently discovered that that's where eels spawn, but it's, they've never seen it. They've never seen an adult eel uh, in this location. The only reason they really know they're spawning there is because that's where they find the smallest uh, larval stages, and that's they have they have tracked uh, with with satellite tags uh, a few eels going to this location. So it's really one of the great um, fish stories, great migrations, and uh, scientific mysteries. It's just re just starting to be sort of uncovered. I always like to add this thing because I know there's this debate about whether there was turkey at the first Thanksgiving, but no debate that there was eel because they were really a state. They were they were so abundant that they were really a staple food of Native Americans throughout the East Coast and um, early uh, colonial settlers as well. So river herring and American eel are two uh, are, are three uh, diadromous fish species. Why are they important? Well, they have this amazing. They both have these amazing life cycles where they're moving from the oceans uh, into our bays and into our rivers and streams and, and then back. So in the process, they're, they're transferring nutrients in, in the form of their own bodies and, and also in eggs in, in the case of river herring. And they're transferring that energy, energy and moving it inland. And um, they, they, you know, they're, they're providing forage for lots of fish while they're out on the continental shelf and their adult forms. As those adults move in to our estuaries, they're feeding a lot of you know striped bass and bluefish and seals and many other species, lots of fish and I mean, lots of birds feeding on these fish. Um, as they move into rivers and streams, otters and raccoons and, and mammals are feeding on them. Uh, lots of bird. This is a gull. Many of you know is a, is called a herring gull uh, because they're known to you know prey on these fish as they move into rivers. Sometimes sometimes gathering along streams by by the hunters to feed. And osprey, osprey, as they're you know, they're, there's evidence that their northerly migration is timed to coincide with the river herring runs. And early in the season, before some of their other prey species are easily available, um, they're really focused on river herring. So, how are these species doing? Well, is this is this, is this sad-looking river herring? makes clear they're not doing so well. The story is not great. And there's two major problems. The, the, the decline is driven by uh, two things. One is this is offshore fishing. They're, they're not a target species, but because they get into mixed uh, schools with Atlantic herring and mackerel, uh, they often are caught up as bycatch. And um, they just, they don't, you know, they're discarded. They don't survive the nets and they really take a heavy toll. And I, I just, you know, think I show these pictures because I like to point out that when we're talking about offshore fishing, we're not talking about these mom and pop operations or, you know, the guy with the sort of yellow rain jacket on a little boat somewhere. We're talking about massive offshore fishing with these, you know, huge 200 foot boats with these pair trawls where they're dragging these football field wide nets around for hours and hours. Um, and they're just, they're indiscriminate. They're catching everything. And you know, there's no chance of getting the wrong species out of the nets. By the time these fish get back to the boats, they're they're dead and and it's they're lost. So uh, there's a lot of concern that all despite our efforts on on trying to restore habitat on on the mainland side, the the, the offshore bycatch issue is really decimating these populations. But the other problem is that they've they've lost habitat because they can't get to the fresh water that they need uh, either to spawn in or, or to spend their lives in. So this is an example 
of um, the, where, where the Carmen's River is dammed at South Haven County Park at Hards Lake. Um, it's not a you know it's not a massive several hundred foot dam like the Glen Canyon Dam, but it's as far as river herring are concerned, it's it's a permanent barrier. This is some video from um, a small stream in Baldwin. Uh, where they're migrating at night and they're trying to get up what amounts to about a, a, a foot high dam at this tidal stage. And you can see, you know, they're just not, they're not able to jump up like a salmon can. They have to try to swim through the water column and it's just not possible. So even, even our low head dams are just not, are, are permanent barriers for these things. I, I find it so sad to watch, but the, the good news at this site at least is that when this site on the highest tides on this dam, the, the water overtops the dam. So these fish at least do get upstream to spawn, but in most sites on Long Island, they don't. Um, and then on the, just switching quickly to eels, eels are amazing fish. And you'll see in this video, they are actually capable of climbing vertical walls in places where they can hold on enough. They're like snakes where they have, if they have two points, they can kind of squeeze and push themselves up. But you'll watch in this video where they're climbing, you'll see how hard it is for them and uh, get an idea that it's, it's you know, it's, some may be able to do it, but if you watch long enough, they mostly climb and eventually fall off. So while it may not be a, an absolute barrier for all eels, dams could create a, a major problem for juvenile eels as well. And these dams were built to power mills like this one on, on the Carmen's River uh, for cranberry bog production, which was a big industry on Long Island at one time, and for ice harvesting. Um, so we're trying on Long Island to, you know, we're engaged, many of these, uh, CTUC and the, the Baykeeper and other organizations in the Herring Alliance, which is trying to get at the bycatch issue. Um, but mostly we're focused here through an organization we call the Diadromous Fish Work Group uh, on, on the habitat issue and trying to um, address the dams and get these fish past, past the dams into, into good habitat. Uh, that's done by uh, installing dam, um, fish passes. This is again the hard, same Hards Lake Dam with the first permanent fish ladder um, in, installed on Long Island. It was one in 2008. Uh, Babylon Village, this is the fish way they put in. You can see the baffles in there. These structures just simply create um, eddies and slow the water down. And the fish, as I said, they're not jumpers, but they're quite good swimmers and they can swim their way up there. And this is not, not a picture from Long Island. This is from Connecticut. This is something we're trying to move to, and that is getting past the legacy of dams on Long Island and uh, just removing them. And we're not harvesting ice or growing cranberries anymore or powering mills. And uh, these legacy dams are not serving their original functions in most cases, but are still presenting significant ecological problems. Um, CTUG is identified with our partners at the estuary programs. Um, the, the, the major places on Long Island where this work needs to happen and compile it into our diadromous fish restoration strategy, um, identifying all the rivers and streams in Nassau and Suffolk County uh, and our river revival map. And, I, and it identifies where in, in green the fish have access and in red where they don't. And if you, you, know, you go through, this is available on our website, you can go through it and you can see how many, you know, there's almost no dam, no rivers or streams along Long Island where um, the fish have, would that have not been dammed or the fish have access. Uh, but the, one of the, the most important things we do and to sort of put wind in the sails of restoration efforts is, is to find these fish and to find them in over a hundred rivers and streams is obviously no small task, which is why we're so excited that you're able to join us tonight, have an interest in being involved in our annual uh, river herring and eel survey. Uh, this is really one of the longest running community science projects 
on Long Island. It's, it's going on uh, close to 20 years. Uh, and in really um, every every project, every fish ladder or um, any other effort that's been completed on Long Island has started with the knowledge that the fish are there trying to move upstream. And in most cases, uh, that work has been done by volunteers. So moving on to the survey and the approach and goals, it's you know it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's a survey that gets volunteers out to look at streams uh, from March 15th to May 15th. Uh, a very simple protocol, which is just we ask that you stay on a, in a location and monitor a spot for 15 minutes. Doesn't you don't stand in the same exact spot, but if you're at a um, a spillway where a dam is, you can you know, walk around and watch for 15 minutes because it's it's amazing how many times uh, even I in places where I you know even when I know there's fish there sometimes you know it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the situation and and really sort of clue into what you're what you're seeing and and it really you know needs to sort of you just sort of stand there and, and give your eyes a chance to see what's in the water and then we want to know what you're seeing or or not seeing and and um, we've and Ariel is going to touch on. Um, how this works. It used to be a paper-driven process where we ask people to submit uh, forms. Now it's all digitized. We've made it as easy as possible. And um, you know, zeros are important. And we encourage people to tell us if they don't see anything, uh, we want to know that too. Uh, our goals are also pretty straightforward. Where is spawning happening? Uh, what is the reach of that spawning? If they're in a river, how far upstream are they going? And what is the timing of those runs? And then, in, you know, to the extent possible, try to get a sense of how many fish there are, which is difficult in, in our uh, stream sometimes. Uh, specifically, the 2023 goals are to try to keep finding new runs in places where um, river herring or eels have not been observed. And then there's many streams where we know they, they exist, but we don't, and even where fish passes just have them put in, where we don't know how far upstream they're moving. The Carls River, for example, I showed you that, that dam from Argyle Lake. We know they can get past that dam, but we've, they've never really been observed anywhere upstream of um, Argyle Lake. So that's, there's some other cases like that where we're trying to see how far they can go. Um, and then again, those priority sites from the restoration strategy. Uh, when we're going out to view, to search for these things, we're generally encouraged volunteers to go to places where there's the, either they're, they're at a dam where the fish can't go any further, or the, the, the river stream is sort of restricted and creating a pinch point where they're sort of forced to congregate. Um, and then, you know, calm water is obviously clear water. Calm and clear is much easier to see than sort of turbulent water. So. Uh, and then shallow water. If there, you know, these are fish that are going to stay in the middle of the water column. So if there's deep water, they're going to be sometimes hard to see. And generally, this, you know, these things all sort of sort of point towards being at the first barrier, the place where they are, you know, on that map where the color changes from red, uh, from green to red. So that point where they're going to go as far as they can, and they're going to they're going to congregate and basically stay there. Uh, we ask people to try to get out twice a week um, when the visibility is good, but you know sometimes varying that doesn't always you know, getting on different tides, not always going exactly the same time of day. Um, we have found that in in many of our streams, the fish tend to move at night, and we think that's just because of high uh, predation from sort of visual predators like cormorants and 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 herring gulls. So. Um, if you can get to a site safely and, and watch at night, that's that's always great. And again, 15 minutes at one at each site. Uh, this is not a in the water survey. This is a stay out of the water survey and, and be dry. So we, you know, you don't need to getting in the water is only going to scare the fish away. So we're not, you don't need to get in the water. So stay, stay dry and stay safe. Uh, in the daytime, polarized. Glasses really do help a lot if you if you have access to them. It helps cut the glare so you can see into the water. Um, I'll touch on this. River herring are cryptic and beware of imposters. 
Uh, cryptic is a you know, word that means the animals that are designed to be camouflaged in their natural environment. So there's you know a couple, I don't know, 15 or so river herring in this image on top of this sort of gravelly sandy river bottom. And they're, you know, they're dark on top and they're very difficult to see against that kind of a bottom. So when you're looking for a spot to view, it helps to find sort of a light background, either because it's really light sand or some vegetation. And you can see the fish that are over this, this uh, submerged vegetation here are much easier to see than the ones to the left over the sandy vegetation, I mean, sandy bottom. And then beware of imposters. In this image, there's a couple of river, river herring, and then this, there's a, um, a brook trout there, um, sort of pointed towards 10 o'clock, just much sort of huskier looking fish, uh, much wide, much uh, thicker. Alewife there, brook trout there. Um, these are river herring on the top, and carp, carp are, you know, you're not going to find a 25 inch river herring. If they're 25, if they're, you know, river herring tend to be sort of 12 to 15 inches. They don't get much bigger than that. So if you see some big fish milling about in the river somewhere that, you know, are goldish color or something, they're, they're not river herring. And then this has been a big uh, confusing point over the past uh, five years or so as the Atlantic menhaden or bunker populations have rebounded and they've been, they've been inshore a lot and they gather, they do sometimes push into the rivers and streams. They're not diadromous fish, but they get pushed in by, by um, bluefish and, and striped bass and other predators. Um, these fish are often right near the surface of the water and lined up like they are in this image. So that's something that river herring don't do. River herring are gonna be in the middle of the water column and milling about each other. They're not gonna be lined up like this. This is again, that same mill river image that I showed you. I showed you the, these fish from in the water before, but this is what they look like from above, kind of milling about each other. Not lined up, not at the top. And bunker can be quite a bit bigger. They can get sort of you know, up to two feet long and, and they're, they're just bigger fish than river herring are. Um, scales every year, we, you know, one of the first things we, we see anywhere on, on the island are, the, are pictures like this. Before anybody sees a fish, uh, you know, the raccoons find them first. And generally, the first sign is that there's some scales on, this, on the shore. And you might think, well, I'm never going to see scales. Um, but in you know, this time of year, when, there's not, when everything is sort of brown and, and not, there's not a lot of, thing, not a lot of green uh, vegetation growing, and there's leaf litter, they're quite easy to see. And they, especially if it's sunny, they do sort of glitter in the sunlight sometimes. So you can look for that on the shoreline. Uh, I mentioned that the, the gulls will gather when there's fish around. They, you know, they tend to know they're there before we do. So if you see gulls gather this like this, you know, there's probably some river herring around. Uh, night herons, you know, if you see four or five night herons over, over a creek somewhere, uh, there's probably a reason that they're there. And same with osprey. If you see osprey sitting sort of in a wooded area over a creek where you don't usually see them, that's probably why. So these are all things to look for and can be recorded on our, um, our data submission uh, form. And I, I, with that, I'm gonna wrap up and turn it over to Ariel. Thank you, Enrico. Mm -hmm. Once you stop sharing your screen, then I can go ahead and share mine. Perfect. Okay. So like Enrico mentioned, I'm going to show you all how to access the River Herring and American Eel Survey. And we can do this in three different ways, technically. Um, can you see my web browser? Okay. Yep. Okay, yes. great. So, to use your computer and use your computer browser, if you're more familiar with that and more comfortable versus the mobile device, what you can do is just head on to our website at ctuck.org. This is what your main page will be. And then you're going to head over to get involved. And under our community science projects, the second to last survey is the River Herring and American Eel Survey. 
So this web page specifically is going to be a great resource for um, any follow-up, any resource that you might need to revisit. So for example, you'll see here, we have the 2023 River Herring and Eel River uh, uh, survey resources. So you have those protocols, the various regional sites, um, and the links to the surveys. So the survey that I'm going over right now is all of Long Island, but there is a separate Westchester survey, which you can access from this webpage. This is where we will house the recording that we are doing now. So once this is over, you can check back shortly and we will have that up on here for you to review. And then as you go down, you can see that the survey is embedded directly into the web page. So if you prefer to use your computer, you could just hop on our website and check out this page. And I'll just go through some of the questions here. They're pretty straightforward. Anything with the red asterisk, you have to submit information for. Um, so if you go to enter in your data and for some reason it doesn't let you, make sure to just double check that you have information in those red asterisk boxes. Um, so it asks for your name, email, river or stream, and these are all in alphabetical order. So you would just scroll down through the drop down menu. But if for whatever reason there isn't a stream here listed, you can click other and then type in that river stream. From here, we have the geolocation question. I, I would suggest you allow it to use your location. I'll specifically talk more about this on the mobile device. And if you're using this in the field, it will make more sense. Um, but if you decide to submit your information from home after being out in the field, just make sure that you are logging in the location of the stream you surveyed earlier that day, um, because it will automatically show the location where you are right now, if that makes sense from your computer. Um, then you go down and again, straightforward date time of your survey, um, title stage, and we have a resource for that that I'll go into a little bit more with the phone, water temperature, weather, and then of course, whether river herring are present, how many, same goes for American eels, and then other species. So like Enrico had mentioned, if you see herring gulls or osprey, um, you can make note of that. So in case you don't see river herring at that time, but you notice those indicator species, that's some great information to have. In addition, we have spots where you can take live photos or upload photos that you took earlier in the day here. And then at the end, we have a notes section. So if there's anything that you feel um, would be important for us to know, please feel free to type it in right there. So that's one way. And now I'm going to show you the two ways you can access the survey from your mobile device. So I'm just going to switch over here and show you my phone. Okay, do you see my phone screen? Okay, great. So in order to access the River Herring survey through the Survey123 mobile app, you're going to have to download the free mobile app first. And we have that all set up from that web page as well. So I'm just going to go navigate back to our website, which is ctuck.org. And this is what it looks like from your mobile device. You're going to hit menu, get involved. And again, under community science projects, you're going to choose river herring and eel survey. So that's what it looks like from your phone. Again, the recording, that survey is still embedded in the web page, so you can use it there as well on your phone. And then we have accessing the Survey123 mobile field app. So again, you're gonna need to download that app from whatever phone provider store you have. And since we're on our phone right now, we can't scan the QR code to access the survey, but we do have a link here under the second bullet point. So you can access the survey by clicking there. And if for whatever reason you wanna go back and just use the browser, you can do that 
right there by hitting that open and browser button, but we want to look at the survey using the field app. So as you can see, I have the app downloaded and it automatically opened the app on my phone. What's important to note here is that you do not need an ArcGIS online account. You will just choose the third option that says continue without signing in. So there it has the survey all populated and ready to go. Again, name, email, stream. And I just wanted to note here under the GeoPoint question, the crosshair, if you choose that, it will automatically show you where you are in that moment. You can drag this around and then it'll open it into a wider map. I usually just use the map option. It goes straight to that. So it shows you where I am. You can at the top search for a location or put coordinates into that search bar. On the right side panel, you can see that four squares. You can change the base map. So if you're more comfortable with using something that looks like this, it might take a second to load. Um, you can change how that looks. I like to use imagery with labels. You can use the plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out. And then if you hit the crosshair again, it brings you back to where you are. So once you have that location set, you would hit the bottom right corner, that check, and you're all set to go. Again, I would recommend to allow location services on your phone to make sure you're getting the most accurate um, reading of your location. From here down, again, we have the date, time of the survey. And then here's that title stage that I just wanted to go into quickly. We have resources for local tides. If you wanted to check that out, I get the prompt that says, would you like to use your current location? So yes. And for me, my nearest tide gauge is Cold Spring Harbor. So that's what I'm going to choose. And from there, you can see what time low tide is, high tide is, which could then give you the information for answering um, those questions. Um, so if you have a rising tide, for example, you would be in between the times of 1.30 and 7.45. So say you headed out at five o'clock, you would be choosing rising tide. And then vice versa, if you were going from a high tide to a low tide, in between there, you would go and choose the falling tide. If I decided to go out tonight at 7.45, I would then choose slack tide. So it's either at low tide exactly or at high tide exactly, where you have that slack tide where the water's not moving in or out too much. Now, if I can go back here, Again, if you have a thermometer, you can do the water temperature. Um, and that's pretty much everything. And the one thing I also wanted to note is after you're done filling out this information, you would click the bottom right check, or if you decide to save it for later, you can save it as a draft. So if you wanted to hook up to Wi-Fi or whatever the reason might be, you can hit the top left X. This prompt will come up. And then you can hit that top save in drafts. Now, if you see right there, that orange circle, it's basically just saying that you have a survey in your drafts that you need to finish and submit later. And what's really cool about the survey one, two, three app is that you can house all of your community science surveys in one place. So you can see, I have Batmap, Long Island, um, Coyote Tracker, Terrapin Watch, and also my River Herring survey. So it's a really cool, kind of one-stop uh, shop situation for our community science projects. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing here. And I think that's all for the survey portion. Does anyone have any questions about the survey itself before we go into the breakout sessions? I, I just, I was going to just add one thing that I noticed in the chat about using GoPros and, and Byron Young responded that it is, it is a great way in situations where you're not sure 
what's in the water. It's very easy to dip a, a GoPro in and get some quick video. And um, so, yeah, if you have access to one, it's a great tool. Oh, Don. Okay, good. All right. So we'll go through. That's good. All right. I'll just start going through these. The first is Mill River. This is the river that runs through Hempstead Lake State Park down through Rockville Center. Um, this is the site of where I, this is Smith's Pond in Rockville Center, the site of where that video was from. Um, it's uh, there's a new fish, there's a new fish ladder there. We're going to be, SeaTac will be spending a lot of time monitoring this it, this year, but it's still great to get people there to let us, you know, it's always, you, know, you never know when these fish are going to show up and it's great to get eyes on sites like this. So it's a little bit of a challenging site to get to, but um, it's behind, it's sort of, it's, this is the Long Island Railroad here. Uh, this is the, there's a King Cullen here, Sunrise, this is um, Sunrise Highway right down here. So you can turn off Sunrise Highway into the King Cullen, go through the parking lot, and then up to this Nassau Street, which is, this is the bus depot. And you can kind of go back here in the park. They have a new, this has all been redone with a new park. It's quite nice. So there's plenty of parking. And then you can easily walk down to see the, um, the fish ladder in the spillway. Uh, there's that same King Cullen again. This is the other side of this of this huge 700 foot underground culvert that these fish navigate. And this is again a public park, the Mill River Complex Park. And there's another site here as I go into the culvert where they can be seen. And if, if everyone wants to stop me with questions, I'll just keep going and assume that everybody's staying with me. Um, I'll monitor the um, the chat also okay. if folks okay yeah want to put questions there yeah we can we can spend more time on any one of these sites if people want to um, Belmore Creek this is just just west of the Wanta uh, Parkway this is a site where um, SeaTac is working with Nassau County to develop fish passage plans um, at at Merrick Road and. Um, We'd love to get this. Is the, this is what the spillway looks like now? Uh, we're trying to install fish passage here, but we're you know we love, we want to try to keep sight of the fish that are move as they're moving in, and when they're here, we actually get sometimes do get permits to move fish over the dam just to help kind of grease the wheels a little bit on this fish run and get them into the pond this year before um, before the fish passage is installed. So. Well, we, and last year we had a we had a poor we had poor numbers here. We never were able to catch any fish to move upstream. So, if they're in there and and people see them, we'd love to know about it. Uh, Massapequa Creek is uh, at at um, Merrick Road. has It has two spillways, east and west. There's a fish ladder on the uh, on the west spillway that was installed. In like 2009 or 10, it was one of the earliest fish ladders on Long Island uh, as part of a, a super, there was some funding from a super fund recovery or something. Uh, so it's on the West Spillway. Unfortunately, most of the fish seem to show up on the East Spillway. So we have done fish lifts here, moving them over the dam. Um, so it's there's two spots to monitor here that are always helpful. But again, we have very little evidence of the fish even though this fishway has been here for 10 years, uh, that they're anywhere upstream to the next barrier. The next barrier is um, at Sunrise Highway. This is Matt, this is a Mass Peaker Preserve just north of the tracks at Sunrise. And there's, um, I don't think there's a picture here, but it's actually easier to see them. If anybody knows this site uh, on the, where the bike path comes up on the down on the south side of Sunrise. I'm sorry, it's over here. This is Sunrise. On the south side of Sunrise, where the bike path comes through, there's a site where the fish go into the culvert that goes under Sunrise, which we have, we've had one potential sighting of river herring there. One, one sighting one time a couple of years ago. It's the only evidence we've ever had that the fish are, are navigating through uh, Mass People Lake and upstream, and we'd love to know that they're up here because this is a site where we potentially have a, a fish passage project and and get them into a lot lot more upstream habitat. 
Uh, this is the this is just uh, east of no, just, yeah, just east of Massapequa Lake, Massapequa Creek. Uh, technically called the Jones River, but everyone you sort of knows it by this Unqua Lake, also at Merrick Road. We have had some sightings here, but not in recent years. We have we haven't had a lot of coverage here, so this is a an easy easy access access uh, site, but difficult to park. I think. The park is, you know, closed. I think you can park over here and walk across. Oh, and here at the community park. That's what the that's what the big orange oval is for. Sorry. Yeah, it's the north side. You can walk down here through the path and get to the spillway. All right, so that's NASA. Not that many sites. Um, there's also, it's not on here. If anybody, I don't know, Ned, if you live near Baldwin, but... Um, if you know where Silver Lake is in Baldwin, it's been a site of a big uh, governor's office of storm recovery um, re uh, restoration project. And there's, we've had, that's where that footage was of the fish trying to go up the dam at night. Uh, just north of there is a little, um, a little pond where there was a little tiny fish ladder put in that we've, again, we've not ever had any, it was just installed last year Kind of after the run was over so this is really the first year it's available and we're curious to see if the fish could get to it if you want to read if you're uh interested um ned let me know and i can give you the details of how to get to that don is um don is interested in that okay all right let's tell yeah i'm sorry don yeah not ned. don um yeah don let's i'll let's have some email correspondence about it or or, or phone conversation that would be helpful to have somebody there. Uh, the Carl's River, this is, again, that site of a fishway installed in, in 2010 or 11. Uh, we, we, had a, we had a camera on the, the fishway installed then for a couple of years. We've, we've documented fish swimming through it, but at no time since have, have we ever documented fish in Argyle Lake or anywhere in this really great uh, river herring habitat between Argyle Lake and um, um, I'm, I'm trying to blank on this pond's name. Geiger Lake? No, nah, Geiger is this one. Yeah, you're uh, right. Uh, Belmont of Geiger is yeah, I'm drawing a blank on the name of this lake. But anyway, it's it's a this is a permanent barrier. The fish have no access, but this is really good habitat, and we'd love to know if they're using this and getting uh, past, you know, getting, actually using the, the, getting past this pond and getting into the habitat. There's sort of two worries here. One is there's a ton of cormorants on this site, and it may be that they're just picking off any number of alewives that are getting in here. The other problem is that the um, the town has a flood control structure on the on the east side of this spillway, and the fish ladder is on the west side of the spillway, and so the most of the flow is it's coming off over here. And I worry that the fish, you know, they're attracted. There's just, you know, there's just a notion of attraction flow that they want to, they go where they feel the most water flowing. And it may be that they're just over, they're stuck on the east side of the spillway and not getting over to the to the ladder. So that's something that we would like to know more about if people can get to this site. Uh, there's public parking just to the east of Argyle Lake here. And it's an easy walk over to, to you know, with, on both, you can get to around the spillway on both sides. So that's a good one. I mean, Argyle, the Carl's River has got a lot of potential, especially if we can get fish passage. Oh, Southern's Pond, this is called Southern's Pond. If we can get structure in here, there's, you know, it opens like another two miles worth of uh, river habitat. Yeah, this is uh, Southern's Pond. Uh, Sapawamps Creek is the creek uh, in between route where Route 231 comes down and meets Montauk Highway. Um, our former colleague Emily has has that seen river herring in this little pond at this. This this is this looks like grass. This is actually the lake itself, which is covered by algae, I guess, in this photo. But um, the fish are coming up. The creek is tidal through here, and there's a long underground culvert. 
these are the kind of culverts that we used to think river herring wouldn't swim through because they were too dark. And um, but we've learned at the Mill River, where they're going almost 700 feet underground, that they they could as long as they you know they sense that water upstream and the flow is good, they'll go they'll go underground. And this is only a few hundred feet, so this is no problem for them. But Emily sighting is the only sighting we've had. We don't know that they're still using this site, so that's a good one. Uh, parking is a little tricky. I always park across the street at the diner and just walk across here. Otherwise, um, yeah, she has the, the road to the west circled. It might be easier instead of trying to cross all these lanes of traffic. Uh, Westbrook Pond. This is um, the pond. Uh, it's, it looks like it's uh, part of Kanekwat State Park. It's actually part. It's actually part of Bayard Cutting State Arboretum. It's just uh, west. This is Kanekwat River here, so it's just west of. Well, this is the main stem of the Kanekwat, but it's just west of that. It's a. It's essentially a tributary of the Kanekwat. Uh, this is a site. This was a pond, like it shows in this picture. But this dam uh, failed in 2019, I think. And this entire pond uh, drained. And now there's just a st stream flowing through the middle of it. Um, and it's even though th this is somewhat Im impounded by Sunrise Highway, uh, th there's actually it's actually passable for fish here. So this is now one of the few undammed rivers or streams on Long Island. Uh, New York State Parks has not officially made a, a decision about the future of this dam yet, and technically they could still rebuild it, although as the years tick by, it seems seems very unlikely at this point. Um, but we have yet to see river herring here, and we, you know, it's a little bit difficult site to see. We generally are having people go to the dam. You can park right on the road and just walk to what used to be the dam here. But there's also potentially spots to see them down here where the road, where the river goes under uh, Montauk Highway. So, or even uh, if you in, into the Arboretum and walk the what's called the river path, you can walk right into this spot here. Uh, it would be great to know that river herring are moving in here. It would be great to get them into the stream. This entire up, um, up upper portion of the of the stream is surrounded by open space. It's never been developed. It's one of the most natural looking stream systems uh, on Long Island. And it would be, it would just be great to know that the fish are, are taking advantage of it again after 120 years of being blocked off. This is what that, this is where this, there used to be boards here. This is the dam that broke. It wasn't really the dam, it was the, the spillway. The boards failed. Uh, Parks wasn't able to, to um, repair it in time. And it, it just sort of started with a couple of broken boards and eventually the whole thing just completely collapsed and the pond drained out. All right, this is starting to get out of my territory a little bit. So if anybody wants to chime in on these locations, but Terrell River is, this is this huge, um, pond in um, Santa Maria Riches. There's a really nice newly done uh, park here. I think it's the town of Brookhaven Park. Uh, there's a culvert that kind of winds over to the very west side of the of the of the impoundment with where the dam is here. And one of our partners from the Long Island Sound Study, Vicki O'Neill, who, who lives in the area, has seen a few uh, river herring moving into the system. So um, but it's only been once or twice, and it would be great to know more because this is really fantastic spawning habitat. If we could, as we say, get some wind in the sails and say that the fish are here and trying. Oh, here's a picture of this little windy spillway, and it goes through a culvert into the dam. I believe this is also a tidal um, for the fish to reach the, the culvert. It needs to be not low tide. Oh, they can only get in on higher tides. I so believe so. You, yeah, so can you hear me? Yep, we can yeah, hear you, yeah. George. Yeah, that, that section there, I'm very familiar with it. I used to, uh, that, that spot there. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's quite dependent on the tide. Low okay. tide, it's... it's uh, not going to happen. There's water coming out of the dam area. Again, there's not a lot. 
So it's going to be difficult for fish to go in there. That, mm. That's affected quite a bit by the uh, tide. So they, it's down here where they, there's just not enough water down below. Yeah, here. you might get lucky and see some in there. Oh. Like I said, uh, we're looking at it in a northerly view. And, yeah. uh, um, but it's difficult there for uh, fish to get up there on low tide. I mean, okay. there's water there, you know, but they're really, the backs are out of the water. Their backs will be out of the water. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's good to know. The, you know, it'd be nice yeah. to get some pictures of that situation. Now, it's easy for me to go there. I'll be checking that spot out. Great. And I yeah, I'd like to see that low, you know, that low water condition and see if there's, you know, yeah. you know. uh, Real quick, do you know what they actually did to that spot? Because I know they had the uh, backhoe and stuff there, but it looks the same to me. I don't, I don't know what they did. I don't know. Some work. I thought there was a feasibility study that Town of Brookhaven was recently awarded funding for, uh, for yeah. Terrell, but I don't, don't quote me on that. Yeah, because that little creek is, that, that thing is only like about two feet wide there. It looks like it's water. It's only about two, three feet tops wide. Yeah. And, um, I saw nothing being done, but they had a backhoe there. They might still be there too. Well, there's, um yeah, there's parking at the, at the yeah, park across the street. Here at the, the yeah. playground site, yeah. Yeah, and there's a great, uh, there's a great uh, natural, uh, 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 several hundred acres right across from it. Yeah. True. True. Okay, but I'll, I'll be checking that spot out. Thanks, great. George. Uh, Seatuck Creek. This is another huge impoundment um, with a big, rel relatively large drop for the South Shore. Um, I think this also has some. You can see how much the water spills off here. It seems like. You know, seven or eight feet before it reaches the ground, but I think this might also be a low tide, low flow situations at low tide. Yeah, that's that's tidal also quite yeah, a bit. So, um, but again, there's really just tremendous amount of habitat upstream if we get the fish in there. I don't know that the, I don't. I'd have to look at the reports. I don't know that we've had any river herring sightings here, and it, part of it might be just the very difficult spot to see because it kind of just dives right under the road on the north side here. And then downstream, like you can see, even see here, there's very little water. Um, this must be low tide in this picture, right? So it's a difficult spot to get into. But great habitat upstream if we can get it. I would also say that the, um, I don't know exactly, I think in this image we're looking here. This is, this is I think, called Little Seatuck Creek right here. And this is a site where we've documented river otters and have helped, helped, we've created a little otter steps to get them into this uh, impoundment here, which is um, all, all town of Brookhaven owned properties, really protect, nice protected site here and upstream. So it's, it seems like quite good habitat. And it's curious to us that we've documented otters here, but not in this stream, which seems bigger. And we wonder if it may be that there's some usage of this by river herring or other, or eels, or so it might just be better that the habitat here is more protected and they, they're finding more food there. So, I mean, you know, this could be another site to check out. Now we're getting, now we're getting way east, it's Bianc River. Um, yeah, I don't really know this site. Anybody, George? You know this one? Oh, I've there's yeah, I've seen this. There's a light, very nice, uh, like um, office building, like a, in an old, like restored. This river flows right through the under this building. It's like a nice brick. It was I guess it was a mill site at one time, turned into a nice office building, and the water flows right under. We I've seen eels in. I've we've seen eels in here. I don't think the river herring have been documented, but. Again, nice upstream protected corridor could be good habitat. I'm uh, I'm gonna note for any of the folks who haven't done this before, if you're when you're looking for eels, just really make sure and take a minute and really mm -hmm. look because they can be they're very small, um, not super pigmented. They can be very difficult, so you really really got to take your time and look for them. But it's really fun when you when you see them. It is fun. Yeah, and in in a site like this, I think this is upstream, and this like this is looking. The building is over here on this site, so this is upstream. And the road is here. 
they're al almost always going to be swimming along the edges of the waterway. They're not going to rarely do you see them like swimming right up the middle. So kind of focus your attention on the on the edges. Hmm. I don't know. That's saying it's that's the yeah, that's not obviously not a river herring so unless the water, unless high tide fills this and they're able to get over that. The eels might navigate some of this, but that's this is a site that could use some restoration. Aspatuck River. And we know this one. South of Brook Road. So this is, I don't know where, where Montauk diverges here, but I guess Montauk is up. Oh, Mon yeah, Montauk might be the north here somewhere. So this is. Uh, Montauk crosses yeah. that. Montauk crosses that. That might be Montauk. So, is it? Uh... Yeah, this is Brook Road. I don't, yeah, I don't really know this site, but it says great access, easy to feed fish are present south of Brook Road. So yeah, anybody, you know, this, I will say this section of, of the island, sort of, you know, the sort of, uh, I guess this is uh, east, this is Southampton, eastern Southampton, or, or is it still? I think um, so. No, that's okay, Southampton. But, but that, this section of like some center Mariches east is really so one of the sort of black holes of our surveying efforts like we have had very very few eyes on these streams and we don't know a lot about them so um if there's anybody on the on the call still that can get to some of these sites it really would be great to, to learn more about what's going on out here this is yeah this is another one i I think we are focused on west of William Floyd Parkway in this. Um, right, that's true. Yeah. So I think we're a little past that. Yeah, no, we're well past that. I think they they sort of do this so there's overlap and. But yeah, so yeah, we'll just buzz through these a little bit just in case anybody is. Yes. I think all of these sites in that part of the island have this low tide access issue. Oh, that's the last one. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Any questions? So, we anybody have any other sites that they're interested in or questions about these sites? Um, in the uh, in twenty twenty one, I was I did this, and um, I was focusing on Browns River. Mm. Um, I could only find like one place to observe, which is kind of where the two rivers fork, but I don't know if there's a better spot. Um, I'm going to switch to the map here. This is our river revival map. And, uh, I don't know what shore you're looking at. Yeah. Browns. Help me, George. Where's the brown? Where am I? It's in Sable. It would be in by in uh just after Sable. Or directly in Sable. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah well, right say, there. But the main it's just about the yeah, you know, a half a mile after um uh, yeah. There you go. Here. Browns River. There it is. So you're saying you're looking up here where it's where it splits? Yeah, that was the only place I could really find any access to. I don't know if I just wasn't being bold enough with like walking on a highway. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it is hard. I don't, you know, George. Do you know this site at all? I, we, no, I, not we, up there. But the, there's sites. There's sites where it's come out. I, um, my eyesight's kind of goofy here. Go down. Go uh, towards the bay more. Yeah, where Montauk Highway is. Where you, I can't see. Sable. Yeah, this, this is the May, the bay, and then. Yeah, is, is there's this Montauk some, Highway. It no, comes out. Good. It comes out that. Um, by the fish market, if I'm correct over there, you can view there. You possibly see some fish going up. If I, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I would say like this, if you're looking right. here, this seems like a good spot because it seems like a, a pinch point. I guess that's just a culvert there because we it's have a bridge. 
There's yeah, Sable. So it's, it's bridge. so it's green there. You know, if you can, is this, this is the railroad track, I guess? Yeah. And is this Montauk Highway? Yeah. Uh, I think that's Sunrat. No. no, this is Sun. That's Montauk. Yeah, that's there. Montauk. Yeah. That's so Montauk no way to right get, there. There's no way to get down here, I guess. Yeah. That would be the spot to look, would be the. I've been at that spot there. You've been at the culvert at the train? Track? Yeah, I've been over there. Yeah, this is where they'd be. And then on this side, there's, yeah, these are tough sides. Wow. Yeah, there's a bit of walking on that one. Well, go knock, we'll go knock on this door and get to know these people. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you got to be careful walking around these places because you never know whose property you're on. And, you know, there exactly. are, yeah, there are just some sites where it's just hard to get to. And unless you know somebody, it's just, you know, you're sort of stuck. So um, I think it's worth looking here, though. I mean, you're in the right conditions. Like, this is enough of a pinch point. It might, so it caused them to congregate here. Yeah, I, I caught a couple in 2021, but. Oh, you did here? Yeah. Oh, really? Well, that's great. It was dumb luck. <laughs> well, it's still worth, yeah. I, luck I, is I, luck. Yeah, we'll take it. That's great. I didn't realize. The Brown River has always been sort of a mystery to me because people thought they were in there, but we never had any records of it. So maybe not until your, your 2021 sighting might have been the first one we documented that's great sounds and like I a good site. yesterday we were at a meeting with the um uh suffolk county sport and advisory council and they just dredged the uh, mouth of it at the bay side oh they did finally yeah yeah oh right oh, great. oh this is the site the they were gonna they did some dredging and put the dredge spoil on the side yeah there. on the side there yeah, yeah. thank you yeah, no, that's great. Anybody else? All right, well, uh, you can let us know if you have any questions as you're going, and uh, we're happy to, you know, even if you have, um, you know, if you were out at a site and, and you think you're seeing river herring, you want somebody to try and, we do try to, if it's a site we don't already know, we we do usually try to get someone there to try to confirm it. So it's sometimes easiest just to meet the meet you that meet the surveyor and 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 find the spot. So let us know what you're seeing, and we'll be happy to meet you in the field. And um, yeah, anything else, Ariel? I'm supposed to let them know. I just wanted to mention that I entered in all of the resources that you'll need into the chat. So that's the South Shore survey site guide that we went through, the survey protocols, the link to the survey itself, and the river revival map that we're looking at right now alongside CTUC's um, website. So if you have any questions regarding the survey itself and any technical issues, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And any general survey questions, I believe Enrico is going to be the contact. Um, no, I'll pass them all to Sally so she can handle them. Perfect. I um, will. <laughs> I will put my email in the chat. If anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to uh, reach out to me as well. Um, yeah. And then there's a question about how often to survey. Um, if you could go out at least twice a week, I believe. Yeah, that seems like, I mean, we try, you know, twice a week seems good. You know, we're, if you could go every day if you want to go every day. And once, you know, any, well, any surveying is good surveying as far as we're concerned. So, you know, as much as you can is great. We're not going to, we're not too strict about it. I'm also going to note that um, don't be discouraged. Sometimes mm. it can take a little bit longer for some, uh, for Alewife to show up at certain sites and some, and some sites they don't, but having no, um, having noting that they aren't there is also important yep indeed and the runs do tend to move from east to west on long island so you'll start hearing about reports in the peconic river and alewife creek first out there and and then not see any fish at your river and feel like oh well they're not coming but they they tend to lag a, a week or two behind so 
but yeah, it's, and you know, the runs have been really down and not just on Long Island last year, coast, you know, the whole coast wide was an off year and the year before that wasn't great. It's, and there's a lot of worry about the impacts that, that the offshore fishing is having. And, um, you know, we're hoping there's some rebound this year, but it's, it's hard to feel too optimistic. So, but yeah, we, the more eyes on these uh, systems, the better. So thanks again to everybody. And, and uh, one quick note, what big indicator, pay attention to the sky. Mm. If you've got Osprey, pay attention. Yep. That's Good a point. big indicator. So look for that. The commas, I think I mentioned here, the commas had a heck of a crowd of Ospreys last year, and I got some great shots. They were there. You could see they were fishing for the Elwise. Yeah, the Osprey, the raccoons, pay they're all- Pay attention to what's up in the sky, and you'll be surprised. Yeah. So. They're good at finding alewives, but they're not good at submitting their data, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's All right. One last question here. Um, the Mill River Spillway at South Pond in RVC has been clogged with leaves and debris this winter. Is there any cleanup? Uh, that's a good that's a good point. We have raised that concern with the village in the past and they have addressed it. So I will I'll make a point that uh, it needs to be cleared in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Can we expect the runs will start earlier this year because it's been so warm or are we not anticipating that? Good question. Yeah, no, I think there is that expectation because the water just hasn't, you know, didn't get that cold. So I think, you know, I think we're going to see fish in March. Like we do, you know, usually see some activity in in, in March, late March, but you know, usually it's April that things get going. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see a busy end of March this year. Yeah. 